I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Um, we're back, B, Jason, Dad. We feel like we kind of got the gang back together again because Dad and I were kind of carrying it while Jace was away uh, on his travels for the show. And Zach's been MIA. We're going to put some uh, missing posters up out on the Internet in computer land, Dad, if we don't see him. If he doesn't show up by the next podcast, we're going to start looking for him. Not It'll sure. be interesting to see yeah. if he shows. Cause I don't, I lost connection when I tried to get all of the filming I had to do done by opening day of duck season, which I did pull off. I know, which was pretty impressive. But I didn't know what day it was. I didn't, but I had a had a it was couple. Like you appeared during the wilderness. Yeah, I just appeared. I mean, I hadn't seen y'all in days. It's been a minute. Yeah. So, but I did a couple of things. Uh, you know, Missy didn't come in till the day after I got in, and our showrunner drove me from Nashville because they were still filming. Yeah, and so because uh, we had something happen that I thought would make good TV, and this was a real. You know, a lot of our show is real life. I mean, there's no script. You know, and so our brother Willie. You know, he he had a conspiracy, because you know how he is. He, he's, I live, he's my next door neighbor. So, you know, you love your neighbor, but in my case, all my neighbors are, <laughs> my, are my family. That's right. So it's, it, it's a double challenge, because... Because you have to love your brother, as Granny always yeah. told us, love your brother, whom you have seen. But families can be difficult, especially when one of your brothers builds this pond that's like a lake. Yep. And he has all it's not it, like a lake. It is. It is it's a, a lake. He took it from a pond to a lake. Yeah. And he filled the lake with all kinds of fish. Well, we're you know, based on our last podcast, you got to be willing to give up everything you have for Jesus. <laughs> all right. But Jesus Himself said, "We were right at the in Luke eighteen. We read it. Yeah. But you will not fail to receive a hundred times. You know, in this age, because you're part of a family." What yours is mine and what's mine is yours, you know? So, Jesus, I mean, so Willie has this pond. And so for the last couple of years, I've been slipping down there. And look, I haven't been greedy. I'll usually stop at five because that's enough <laughs> crappie to feed me and my wife. Well, when Willie goes down and goes fishing, he's put so much money in this pond, which is now a lake. He wants to catch them immediately. So when he started struggling, I noticed that he started making a few comments every time he saw me, like, hey, you going to catch all the fish that I put in there? And so I offered. I said, well, the next time you buy some fish to put in there, yeah. hit me up. I'll split it with you because I felt guilty because <laughs> he thinks, whether it's true or not. I mean, in the back of not my true. mind. Not true. Yeah, I was thinking, I can't catch all those fish. I'm no. only taking five out Somebody called me up on about that. I said, yeah, he's never going to out catch the lake. No. Yeah. So he, you know, he he was kind of going the ten percent, but you know, rule. And I was thinking <laughs> if if because I said I'm only keeping five, and he said, yeah, but if you do it fifty times, I was like, well, that's two fifty. How many fish did you put in there? He's like, well, I put a thousand in. He's like, but other people maybe you know, and it wasn't like didn't yeah. get ugly or anything. Right. But he was just giving me little jabs like. <laughs> I realize you're my brother, but you're catching all my fish without contribution, and that's the, he, he gives me the same jabs for living in the trailer on the on the compound. <laughs> so he'll say stuff like, "Yeah, whenever I have people over, I have somebody hold a sheet up in front of Al's place so they can't see it." Yeah, you know, I get the same jabs. So look, so Willie, does, you know, you know how Willie is. Everything's bigger, better. He brings some more is more some uh, you know fish experts in quotation marks. And when, because it's been so dry here, the palm is so low. They came in there and like did a diagnostic evaluation of the fish that he had out there, and according to him, you know, he they saw one crappie, and you know they put something in the water that makes them come up, doesn't hurt them, but you can kind of assess what's what's there. And you know, he's got a few bass and one crappie. I was thinking. <laughs> 
I call hogwash on that. <laughs> so, so I Willie, didn't know this was running so deep. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's running deep. It's been a thing for a couple of years. So lo and behold, he buys a bunch more fish after this assessment, and he gets Jay, which is your son-in-law, yep. to kind of run. Uh, you know, he's like in charge of Jay's this. new role, and for the yeah. company has been more like managing Willie's. You know, properties. properties and the lake and yeah. hunting. And, and I would never be sharing this if I thought Willie would listen to this podcast. But he's, <laughs> he's never going to. He's it. not going to hear it. So I'm, you know, I'm just telling you what happened. <laughs> so he puts all these new fish out there, and along with all that comes these little signs that says "no fishing." Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I don't know this. I well, this. and now look. So I went to. I was like, look, what? Well, send me a bill because I'll go in with you. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm not saying no fishing. You're welcome to fish there, but we need to give these fish some time to grow up, you know? And so, uh, so I thought, man, I have an idea. I was like, I'm going to tell all my buddies. And, and, and I mean, buddies as in family, Cy and, yeah. you know, God one of them. It's like, Willie's got all these new fish in there <laughs> because I know they can't stand it. You know what I mean? We're going to go check on the pond and see what's down there. So I told my TV crew, I was like, we'll just do it. Don't tell Willie, and maybe if we're lucky, he'll catch them red-handed. I wasn't a part of it. I just wanted to fish. But I kind of organized this, and it, from what I heard, it was a home run because they're all out there catching these new fish <laughs> around signs saying don't do it, and <laughs> Willie gets it, gets there, and he's not happy. So, uh, But part of the reason I'm telling this story is because I thought now i got a new tradition because on duck season eve – I got six of those crappie that they caught. And yeah. I thought, what a way to start the duck season with eating fried, mustard battered, fresh white perch from my brother's pond, who is not happy, <laughs> which I told him I'm going to pay for them. You know, I'm yeah. going to go in 50 50. But I don't know, somewhere in between all that, it was just exhilarating <laughs> and very entertaining. Of course, he was mad, but like with a smile on his face. Yeah. Because he's not really mad. No, he's not really mad, but I told, it's like what I told him. I'm like, the worst thing you can do if you don't want people to fish, especially members just of the family. Just say they can't fish. Just say they can't do That's it. That's it. Well, then we got to do you it. You are 100%. You, you opened yourself up. And he you like, started this by putting a lake in our compound, and then if you're going to try to keep us from getting fish out of it, oh. it's good luck with that. I mean, let me get hey, this Hey, Judge right. Harrison tried it for years, you know, down here at this, his place. I mean, I'm like, look, I quoted the verse that no temptation has seized you what is coming to man. The Lord always provides a door. I was like, but for you to put over a thousand crappie in a pond surrounded by your family and, and, and say, don't do it. That there's the temptation. There's just more than we can bear. <laughs> <laughs> now here's what's funny. And the only reason he was being, what's there. funny is the bass that he put in there are all still in there. Cause nobody will eat a bass. Oh, so you. they're like 12 and 14 pounds. They're massive. My, my grandkids love to catch them, but then you just throw them back. Cause nobody wants a 14 pound bass. What are you going to do with a 14 pound bass? I mean, well, exactly. Fit, so here's what's fit. funny about this story. And the only reason that he didn't get really mad is because most of the fish that they caught and the and the six that I cleaned were not the new ones. That's it. See, that's where the humility happened. <laughs> I'm like the whole Maybe time. Maybe Willie's just a bad fisherman. Is that? That's what uh, I was implying. I okay. didn't say it. I was like, two people or one person is not going to catch all. You the can't fish. catch all the fish. Well, and they claim, Dad, that not these, even close. These fish won't reproduce, is what they claim. Oh yeah, but I don't believe that either. No, I mean that's what they say. Wow, no. there's so, some kind of hybrid. Non reproducer. So that was because I was by myself. You know, that's where I was going with this. I was a bachelor for that night, and uh, and it was before duck season. Wait, this has been your gifted season because you you didn't tell me this. So you got the you got the crappie gift from the little. That's true. I didn't know that. Coup. I've actually gotten three three gifts. gifts well, I, you. I called over there and checked on the film crew, and I said, "How's it going?" And uh, the showrunner was like, "Oh, it's fantastic. We're catching crappie." They're catching a bunch of them, and Willie just showed up. Like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> yep, because he kind of well, had him handcuffed because they're filming you. He's done with the bears. He can't, right? Yeah, like, you had him in a bad. So then I'm like, oh, by the way, do you so mind? What, what the, the 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 theory though? What would bring a man to say, I won't fish 
and I'm going to buy them and stock them, and they're going to grow. Well, they can be used as a food source. Do, does somebody b believe they're really with a pole and a hook? Catch all the fish? <laughs> a thousand not fish. Not over a they're thousand. Not, they're not well, that good. His point was they advised him to wait before you caught them because they're all small. He's right. like, well, they're not big enough to catch. So if, the, I mean, big enough to eat. Like no, like we anybody would keep fish you couldn't eat. So all of a sudden they go down there and they're catching ones that you didn't put in. You know, it was it just turned into just typical fish. You're not going to catch all those fish. No. And whoever your little testing people <laughs> that that experience I reel didn't back work. Time, I reel back in time, and you'll verify this. I would pick up a hook net. Some fish they don't want you to sell, and one of them you they don't want you to keep them either. If you caught them in a net, you you pay for the net, the ticket for it. So you pay for the, but you're catching buffalo, uh, catfish, well, commercial fish, commercial yeah. fish. But many, 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 many times. I would pull the net up, and I'm not kidding. There would be three to four hundred pounds of crappie. Yeah, what he put in that pond. A few times I throw a few out there on the side of the boat, and I just save about ten or twelve of them, fry them up, and eat them. Yeah, you know I I, I was paying for the nets and all that. Technically. You got to release them back in the water. <laughs> yeah, it's not illegal to catch them; it's illegal to keep, keep them. It's you can't help catching them. them. Right. But the people who enforce that law, the game wardens, one of them came to see me one time, and he said, "I'm fixing to have a. He's the he, he he's the one that will find you, turn your number for catching crappie. That'd be and keep breaking the law. So we go out there. He I he said, "I'm fixing to have a fish fry. Do you mind?" Maybe if you did you have a few nets, you didn't run. They knew I was a commercial fisherman by right. trade. That was my livelihood. And I said, ah, let me see. I said, I got a few nets that I didn't run this morning. I said, what do you got? He said, I got a fish fry, but no fish. I said, no problem. Get in the boat. He got in the boat. I pulled out there, ran a few nets on the bank. And I mean, there were se several crappie, fine crappie. When they dropped in the bottom of the boat, I said, we got crappie, but you got to throw them back because you they, you don't want to keep them. Then he said, "Hey, hey, hey, hey!" He said, "Put that in this bucket right here." I said, "Well, you the one to enforce me catching crappie?" And now he all, he, all, he, all I, of a sudden the spirit of the law. <laughs> I would have thought that was a setup, Phil. Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I just said, I, that, I yeah. said, "Hey, you want them?" I said, "But you know they're going to be fined." I said, "But you're the one that finds them." <laughs> I'm betting he wasn't fined. <laughs> I'm hey. betting he paid no. Well, it's pie. like that. Pointed time. to the bucket. He said, "Right here, right here." <laughs> so well, I just kept fishing, and I said, "When you get enough, some you know, things so I'd run another net." Some things trump all law and everything else. Fresh crappie to eat will trump everything. And That's this dude problem. is going to throw them back. Yeah. Well, he saw my end of it. Yeah. So, yeah. for some reason, they never bothered me. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's good. You did a you did a good thing. So when I got back home, you know, I cleaned the uh, fish. I was going to save some for my wife because I had six of them, and they were pretty, you know, pretty decent size. But that's, They weren't newbies. But I just ate fish and fish, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't quit eating them. You know, they were, they were so good, and I looked up, and they, I ate I'll them. Be a, I, I'll I, be. I ate them all. So you, you, there was none left for Mrs. that said, let's, let's take our first break. Zach, it's pretty amazing that uh, the blind was only supposed to last a week in October, but in many theaters, uh, actually, it went into November, uh, which is is pretty amazing, right? I mean, people yeah. really love this film. They did. It, it was it far exceeded our expectations. So yeah, we're excited. So, Dad, I don't know if you remember this. You said if the blind could help one person come to Christ, it would be worth it. But I think it's done a lot more than that. What do you think? I think that I was not thinking large enough and I did, couldn't <laughs> see the power of God that can happen in a heartbeat. You mm. can look up and say, whoa, that's what I got out of this one. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now we're getting somewhere. The, my very prayer was answered when I said, you know, I've been at this 28 years, you know, you know, I'm almost 70. I said, I, numbers, Lord, would make, I know the power's there. I know you love us. But the numbers, but and so I just looked up, 
and the numbers started coming in, I said, oh, he's he's there. And I mean, he moved them on this one. He definitely moved them. There's been stories coming in from all around the world uh, of how people's lives have been changed. Yep. And the good news is we're making a shift now uh, into the digital world where people can have it in their homes. Uh, to be able to watch. So it's out now. One of the places that you can get the same platform that hosts all of our content is Blaze TV. Uh, you don't have to be a subscriber to Blaze TV. Just go to blazetv.com slash the blind and you can buy the digital version of the movie. If you buy now, they're also going to give you a code where you can get 20% off unashamed in the woods and the blind merch only in blaze TV store. So there's a little bonus on top of that. These guys have been great uh, supporters of us and helped us get the word out. So once you to check these guys out, go to blaze TV.com slash the blind to watch the blind today. It's more than a movie. No, but we had a, so she was a little frustrated at me and uh, the house was spectacularly clean because we had been gone so long, she had hired this little group of people that clean houses. They're called the Farmhouse Fairies. You know, they're they're local. Which what a name! <laughs> and so, you know, when you fit when you cook fish, you need a lot of paper towels just because you know I have the batter and you're washing your hands off, and then you put paper towels in the pan because I don't soak up the grease. you have to soak up the oil that that you're frying them. Well, everywhere I turn. There were these little phrases, and, and I realized they were Bible verses. And I thought at first, you know, because I've done so much uh, just ripping the— How are you the, getting these things, these information? Well, I'm just saying I looked when I reached to grab the paper towels, there was a Bible verse. There was a tape, piece of tape. I didn't realize the farmhouse fairies had cleaned the house. When I walked in, I thought, boy, this place is spectacular. <laughs> You thought oh, real fairies had claimed that. Well, I thought Missy had lined it up, but there was a verse on the paper towel, but I thought that somebody selling paper towels had attached a verse to it. <laughs> and uh, I thought, now we're talking, you know, because I've made fun of so many products that use spiritual principles. Well, now they're actually that, putting that That are just lying, you know. They're like selling you angel soft toilet paper, and nobody knows how soft celestial bean <laughs> toilet paper is. And even the implication or is wrong. they also don't know how soft celestial beings are. So well, I mean, exactly. And I, so I always make fun of them. So I thought, this is funny. And uh, so anyway, I tell you that story to say when Missy did get home, because I had collected all the, one of the stickers I had taken off. It was so good. I mean, it was like the Lord is my shepherd or, you know, I shouldn't be in one or what. So I just stuck it. So the verse. I hated to throw it away. I'm like, now what do I do with it? I hate crumbling so up. So the verses were not just linked to to paper related subjects. It was, it could have been anything. Well, it was just anything. Okay. And here's why I say this. So uh, Missy, Missy. <laughs> She came in there and because I had told her about it. I was like, they're selling paper towels now with, with Bible bird. I was so excited. And she's like, no, that's the farmhouse fairies. <laughs> they're, they clean the house and then they attach that to toilet paper, like a roll of toilet paper and to paper towels. They're just sit. It's their way of ministry. Well, then I was like excited because I thought, well, here's a group of women who love the Lord, who are cleaning people's houses, and they're leaving. I, I was really excited about it. But then when Missy, uh, she went into our bathroom, and she said, you're not going to believe this. She said, L listen to this. And she read the one that was attached to the uh, roll of toilet paper, and it said, the moment has come to your royal position for such a time as this. <laughs> I said, that's a Bible verse? She said, that's in Esther. I was like, that's not, that's not a Bible verse. <laughs> it is a Bible. And, and if you think about the implications here, if you're fixing to use some toilet paper. On the throne. You've got a moment. <laughs> the moment has come for such a time as this for the royal position. I was like, what? What are we doing with the Bible verse? Like the on page twenty. And sure enough, my wife was right. She said that's in Esther. It is. It's Esther, Esther four fourteen. Yep. And I thought, you know, it's actually a very famous verse. 
there's a difference in having a ministry and uh, using a Bible verse completely out of context, which was <laughs> funny, I have to admit. Which is why they did it. They were trying to get a laugh. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was so funny. I had to share. I just, <laughs> I just thought, okay, you had me, then you lost me. <laughs> so it makes me think. Now I'm gonna tell these. I'm gonna tell because uh, Jersey Joe's wife, Christine, she makes these uh, like things you hang in your bathroom or in the house with the like, sayings on them and verses. So she's like a decorator type. She got a whole business doing it. Does really well. But I'm gonna tell her about that verse. I'm gonna say if you want to sell these like hotcakes, put this in your bathroom. I think that's. A- but I told that story to say yeah, you're running into situations that I've never even <laughs> contemplated. Well, I thought that's why you find it interesting. Seventy-five, eighty years. But what I was gonna tell you because I know we're in Luke 18, and and I said, look, there's so much, there's so many sermons, and there's so many thoughts, and so many commentaries about what all this means, and and I want to reiterate, the Bible is about Jesus. And all the issues that come up, we talked about money, because here's Jesus telling the rich young ruler for our last podcast, go sell everything you have. Well, you know, legalistic people, they and what I mean by that is like a rule-oriented type religion, I mean, their heads start spinning. Yeah, because Jesus is saying stuff that they're like, well, he didn't, and they'll start telling you what he didn't mean, <laughs> you know, when they read a verse like that. Because here was the, this rich young ruler was a very righteous person. I mean, how many of us could? I mean, Jesus said, you know, the commandments: don't commit adultery or murder or don't steal or don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother. I mean, how many of you could say what he said when he said, well, all these I've kept. I got those. And instead of Jesus making some kind of legal argument after that, he took the one area, because he knows our hearts, where this guy had put his power and security in, which was his money. And he's like, go sell it all. So we had a wonderful discussion in our overtime last time about it's not really about a tenth. That was under the Old Testament. Jesus actually, he, he what he does is he offers way more than we ever could expect or yep. imagine. Okay. He really does. Yep. That's right. He's talking about forgiveness, purpose, how you got here. He offers you eternal life, a character that the world desperately needs. He, he offers way more than we can grasp or imagine, but he also demands more. And I think in this case, you see that he wants all of you. He wants you to, to surrender. It's, it's not like he's trying to inspire you or make you better. He wants to make you a new creation. And I think that's the thought that I wanted to get across as we move on to the next two paragraphs at the end of Luke 18. No, I think that's good, Jase. And I think, and you made a point, I think in the last, uh, in the last podcast, but then we kind of reiterated it again during the overtime that the, the situation here is as much about power uh, as it is anything, and money relating to power. And I think that's so much, that's so true in the biblical narrative, but it's also true today that you see that. I want, before we totally leave the idea of the rich young ruler, because we, we didn't get a chance to talk about it as much at the end, and I want to talk a little bit about that before we move on to the next one, because I think there's a, I think there's a nice link into this when he pulls the 12 aside, is that they were, they were, the apostles, Peter is the one that gets the credit, but I'm sure they were all thinking it, they basically come back with a fairly fearful response of, wait a minute, like, one is, if this guy can't, if he's not the picture of everything, then what about us? Because he, in their minds, he was bringing way more to the table. What they didn't realize is that they had surrendered everything to follow him, which is what Jesus was looking for at the beginning. It didn't matter that you had a fishing enterprise or you were a man of great wealth. The idea was whatever you have goes at the feet of Jesus. But they were fearful in their response because, Jason, I think they were comparing themselves to other people, which people still do that today. They look at it and say, well, this guy over here, yeah, they, they really have what's going on. But, you, you know, we none of us should ever do that because – God has called us to surrender. So no matter what that guy over there does, no matter what she yeah. gives, I mean, all that's between them and the Almighty. We shouldn't compare ourselves. I, I think 
that's something the apostles do here. And then he comes back and says, look, you gave up what you needed to give up. You don't need to worry about other people. Don't worry about this guy that couldn't make the cut. You need to keep doing what you're doing, which is why he tried. Well, are you really going to rely on God's power or are you not? That's right. Well, it's interesting that 33 trillion, the United States of America is in the hole. 33 trillion over, over, over payment. That's a lot of money. That's how much we've spent. Yeah. And it just we don't climbing have. and climbing and climbing. Correct. Now it's up to 33 trillion. There's somebody says, dude, what? How in the world is a country going to get over that 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 debt right there? That's 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 the people, the powers that be. Right. Well, you'd never get past anything like that in your personal walk, right? Well, you might ought to put your confidence in a heavenly country. <laughs> you better you better go for something. To use Hebrews eleven as an example. So we, we you know, watching your budget has pretty well flown away. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's take another break. So sometimes dad you just have to complain a little bit, um, and it pays off. I've been complaining on the podcast that Zach has hijacked uh, one of my favorite things, and that's my box of awesome from Bespoke Post, which is one of our sponsors. He hijacked them. I mean, all of a sudden, I'm getting these great boxes every month. I'm getting to check out this cool stuff that I've signed up for, and then nothing. You know, I'm thinking I got weeded out, and then I find out Zach's getting all of my stuff. So I griped about it enough. Now I'm getting my boxes back. Uh, this last month, I got this really cool knife, uh, which I love. I, you can never have enough knives. One is TSA has several of my better ones. Uh, I finally quit putting them in my bag so that they confiscated them. But uh, this was one of the things I got. One of the things I love about Box of Awesome is they have a lot of small brands uh, from around the country, and they use these guys. And so we at one time were a small brand as well, and so I love that. Uh, to get started, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a quiz at boxofawesome.com, and so your answers are going to help them pick the right Box of Awesome for you. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories, so I just got mine, as I said. Each box is valued at around 70 bucks, but you only pay a fraction of that price. Plus, as I said earlier, with each box of awesome, you're supporting a small business. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from small and upcoming brands. It's free to sign up. Uh, you can skip a month or you can cancel any time, so you get to control that. You get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. Enter the code Phil at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com. Use the code Phil for 20% off your first box. This is a great holiday gift. It's a great idea to sign someone up to get your box of awesome at boxofawesome.com. Use the code Phil. I do think that there is a kingdom analogy that Jesus is using in this when he told his disciples in the in the latter verses of this in Luke 18. I mean, I was in Mark 10 in Mark's version, but because I want to use that to correlate with what we're going to talk about today, and he and he seemingly does the same thing that he does in Luke 18, except in Mark's version. He adds the story of where James and John request, mm -hmm. you know, their position of power, which is where I, I got the idea. Yeah, I got you. Because you know, if you if so, if you go to Mark ten, if you're able to do that conveniently, so he tell Mark gives the account of the rich young man. Mark 10, that's 17 through 29 and 30 and 31. But what I wanted you to see is when he says in 29, he says, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, and with them persecution in the age to come, eternal life. So he says similar to what Luke yeah. account is. And I said the only way that that can be true, in my opinion, 
is if he had this view that the kingdom is made up of people who have surrendered to the king. You have a forever family who are linked by the Holy Spirit of God, those who have surrendered to Jesus. That was the that is the kingdom on earth. And on the age to come, when the kingdom is transformed into this same group of people who are now imperishable via the resurrection. Yeah. Then you live forever. Right. I, mean, I think I think people who do who who That's are still wait, waiting on the kingdom, they have trouble with this verse. That's right. Because they're like, well, what does he mean? Because most of the Christians I see, they don't have much. Oh yeah, you do. You have a forever family that's across this globe of people who have surrendered to Jesus, whose responsibility is to take care of each other. That's why when you look at Acts 2, when we say the Holy Spirit fell and the kingdom was established on earth through the church, and those 3,000 came to the Lord after Peter shared Jesus, do you remember that next paragraph where it said they, they had things in common, they shared with those who were in need? Well, that's... That was all this that Jesus was referring to, in my opinion. Yep. What do you you're, think? You're correct. You thought I'm about that? No, I hadn't thought about that. So, so then he predicts his, his death. He does it in Luke 18. I'm fixed to read it. But he also does it in Mark 10. But in Mark 10, he then adds this where James and John in verse 35, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I want you to notice in verse 36, he asked a, uh, a question, and I missed this when we studied Mark, and I really think it's powerful, which is why I'm going through this. He asked a question, which I want to ask our audience today. He says, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. And the reason I'm making a big deal out of this is because I didn't realize Mark 10, 36 said that, and then in verse 51 of Mark, Mark, when he, 11, Mark 10, Mark 10 get, guess what he asked the blind man who was on the side of the road saying, Son of David? You know what he asked him in verse 51? What do you want me to do for him? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. We have the same question mm -hmm. in the same chapter given to do two different groups of people. One is a blind man which the blind man responded in 51, I want to see. In verse 36, they, uh, when Jesus asked his disciples, James and John, who were, who were saying, will you do whatever we ask? Because they obviously had gotten that question from the sections where it says, ask and it will be given to you. You remember when Jesus said that over and over? Yep. Well, they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Uh-oh. They wanted some selfish power here. <laughs> Jesus a right said, hand man and a left hand man. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Of course, I'm sure they were thinking, well, what happened to this? Whatever we want. That's right. Whatever you ask in my name. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said, you will drink the cup I drink and the bab and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Mm. And so when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And then he goes into his last miracle before his death on a cross, which is a man who was blind, referring, hollering to Jesus, saying, Son of David. And the reason I'm making a big deal of that he realized who Jesus was, even though he couldn't see, which is incredible. Yeah. And, and Jesus eventually healed him. So when you go back to Luke 18, and you have the story of the rich young ruler, in verse 31, he says, he took the 12, and he said, we are going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man must be fulfilled. So 
Keep in mind, he's going to Jerusalem that's to a die. Big, that's a mouthful, to, <laughs> that what you just said. And everything about him coming in the uh, line of David, this promise to the, uh, what's the, that phrase, the Davidic line, uh, this promise about the kingdom coming that would, would destroy all other kingdoms and, and itself endure forever, and, and all the prophecies about Jesus not having a bone broken, or you know, you, there's a lit. I don't know how many fulfilled uh, prophecies. Right, riding on the the uh, foal of the donkey, the yeah. I mean, the praises coming in. I mean, just over and over and over and over and over. Which is fascinating that God chose to work this out in actual time in history and to fulfill prophecies that did come true, which gives you all the evidence that you should need to realize that Jesus truly did come from heaven through the human ancestry and it was prophesied and they all came true and while you're there we the lost the entire you. world <laughs> the, the entire world to this day counts time by jesus exactly Christ. you yeah. go to china there what a coincidence yeah <laughs> so look in verse 32 it says he will be handed over to the gentiles they will mock him insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Now, what happened eventually? What he just said. Every day. He, yeah. he, Luke is recording this as a prophecy, and what Jesus is actually saying did come true. Now, watch the next two verses. So it says, The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they did not know what he was talking about. And you say, well, why? Because that's why I read Mark. They're, they're wondering, where's the power? When, now, let's, let, let's take over. Who's going to be on your right and left? And Jesus starts talking about dying and being flogged. And he's spit upon. And he's king? Yeah. Now, obviously, I think the, the biggest problem was they got so upset about Jesus being mocked, insulted, spit upon, flogged, and killed, that they weren't hearing that last part. Because, I, I mean, to me, I would have thought, but you're going to come back from the dead? But they were like, what are you talking about? You're going to be spit upon. And let's take another break. And even, even the idea, Jay, is that when it says its meaning was hidden from them, we kind of take that as that was some sort of supernatural withholding but it could just very well mean they weren't ready to understand it because they didn't understand it in no. other words well they, they didn't, didn't understand, understand it. it and but i think it scared them and, and my point is i think you have to tie it in with the next I mean, story your death is going to save us i think you have to tie this in with the next story because i think that was luke's intent i think that was mark's intent and so i'd like to read it whether we get to it all or not yeah go ahead we can do it next but because cause I want to show you their attitude here. So as Je in verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, which is we're getting close to Jerusalem. Yep. They approached Jericho. A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked them what, what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. What well, my point is, why are they why why are they rebuked? Why do they want him to be quiet? Because Jesus had just told them, I'm going up to Jerusalem and here's what's fixing to happen. And they don't agree, they don't want that to happen. There's multiple places where you remember when Jesus when uh Peter said, oh, that'll never happen. When he predicted his death, oh, yeah. he actually said, get behind me, Satan. Because they don't want that to happen. Well, who would want their leader for, to have this happen? So it's they're the, like, shh, 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 don't be hollering about the son of David. That's right. We're getting closer to Jerusalem. He's trying to sneak in here. So you can tell they're fearful, and they're not, want, they don't understand what the plan is. And maybe it's hidden from them, to your point, Al. It, it, it doesn't matter. But you're seeing a different attitude in the way they're responding and then how the crowd is responding, because what, watch what happens in verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked, 
what do you want me to do for you? There it is again. This question keeps coming up, which is a, it's a really good question when you realize that I don't think Mark did that on accident. Same question, and you have one having a selfish motivation, saying, I want a place of power. Because it really goes back to the rich young ruler on the reason his face fell, too, on how sad he was, is because Jesus attacked the very thing that made him uncomfortable, his power, which was his money. And when he said, give it all up for me and rely, and what Jesus is asking the disciples to do the same thing here. They're like, he's like, you trust me. This is the plan of God. This is going to happen. But that goes against everything we define as real power. Real power to us is crushing people or having enough money to where you can go anywhere you want, do anything you want to do. And if somebody crosses you, you can call your other powerful people and take him out or get him in jail. That's, Instead of, is that not what power is? Yeah, he's is. the one that's crushed. And he said, I'm going to be crushed. You're like, never, no. So you understand what, why this is happening. So in 41, he says, Lord, I want to see. So Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus praising God. Now here, here's what's amazing. The last sentence says, when all the people saw it, they also praised God. But now I want to I want you to fast forward and think about this. So you have the disciples being fearful and not understanding. It's a little headway. He's making some well, headway. Well, you have all the people praising God saying, yeah, but where were these people when he was being crucified? Nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen. Quiet, scared. And my point is, yes, Jesus is awesome when you can get something out of it as far as earthly power. Oh, this is fantastic. There's a, that's why there was such a long line when he was doing miracles. Because it's like, well, if it's for me, that's why it's going to mean more. When they we, didn't grasp eternity. No. It's I, like, it's good if I can get the benefits of this, but still keep my own control and power. Yep. But yep. when I don't, I'm very uncomfortable. And that's why I think the disciples were nervous. But he wanted them to be because he realized, I'm going to redefine what you view as power. Yeah. Yep. Plus, I also think, Jace, that the reason Jesus was so confident in any setting when he was talking about whether it was about wealth, about surrender, that conversation with the rich woman. I mean, think about that. If the Pharisees, teachers of the law, the people that are questioning Jesus, they can't deny something unique and special. I mean, he is a rabbi's rabbi, Ooh. but at the same time, they're like, he's from Nazareth. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't even have a home. He's traveling around with this group of fishermen and a tax collector and these people. And so they can't put it together. But Jesus is so confident when he tells a man to give away all his wealth. The only way you could do that is if you had, you had been the one that created all things. And so as you're standing here in a human body that you've confined yourself to as the deity that created the universe, <laughs> you made the earth full of all its precious metals, and now you can tell people, yeah, just give all that stuff away. It doesn't matter. The only way you can have the confidence to do that is if you made all that. That's true. Which is why he was so confident about what he was there to do. It was so funny because everybody around him, including his inner circle, could not understand that he was the son of God. That was the one they were tripping over That's right. every time. And then the one time they swerve into it, as Jace pointed out, that was brilliant, Jace and Mark, is that the all they want is the earthly power from it. I want to be sitting on the I'm gonna be sitting up on the dice. You know, that's what I want, that's what I want out of this whole deal was more power. I think it's giving you a leg to see, look, because when you get to Zacchaeus, you're gonna see this. You know, Zacchaeus is a very interesting fellow. Because most of the times when you hear a sermon in church today, the preacher is like, Well, you gotta be broken. You got to be desperate. You've got to realize this. You know, and look, I'm not arguing with that. But in Zacchaeus's case, well, he wasn't desperate. He was rich. That's right. He he was a by the worldly standard a powerful person. You know. Yep. And uh, but so what happened? Salvation still came to him. Je Jesus, you know, came. And the point I'm making that you see in this, 
that question is a very important question when you say, what do you want Jesus? What, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Because you really have those two dilemmas. Do you want him to, to help you on earth and have a nice life and give you a bunch of money so you can retire and, and you know, live in whatever retired people do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like have a golf cart and ride around. And, or do you want, to, you want to go to heaven? You want to live forever? Because Jesus' model is not the earthly model for power, success. And, you know, if you live forever with your forever family, I would say that's a higher standard. That 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 should be a more a uh, greater focus than having some little retirement party on Earth and having a few gadgets in and lieu of what, money. What what we, what we see in the world? Well, exactly. But you're but you're right. Let's take our last break. But you're right, Jay. It's the the really the in, which by the way the Bible you won't find the word retirement. Anywhere in the Bible. It's not a biblical term. No, it's... So the only reason why retirement would appeal to you, really, if you think about it, is that if you thought this life was all there is. Well, you know, I've worked, I've earned, I've got a certain place in life, and so now I want to enjoy it. And the parable that Jesus dealt with with that was, remember the guy that built the bigger barns? He was like, what a foolish thing. All this you've built for? All this retirement you've put up and you're waiting on to enjoy because this life is all there is. We Tonight, turn, your very turn, life will be taken from you. We should turn you two, the two of you, turn you loose on what is really real. That's right. Exactly. Because and, and get it to both houses of Congress. That's right. Oh, we can straighten this and, out, Dad. Well, Jason, this, I, Jason this, and I could fix it, I'm telling well, you. This changes your perspective on how to solve problems. Yes, if you Jesus can change your heart, change your view about money on political spectrums. You wind up thirty three trillion in the hole. On political spectrums, all you can do is pick a side. But Jesus can change your heart about this. That's why we're open to all people and we love all people. And why Jesus had a bad reputation because he can change how you view everything, including money, and and it puts it in the proper perspective. So you should use it for things that you know make the world a better place but you want to do it in a way that gets people to focus on Jesus cuz he can change your heart and that's the one thing the political spectrum can't do they're always just defending their side they hate the other side they're never contemplating about changing the mind and heart of the other side cuz that you don't have the weapons to do it all you have is arguments i i looked at the woman this morning just a woman and her husband brought her but but I just noticed that there was remorse and tears. Remorse and tears. And we're standing in a pool of water down there. I thought, Yep, she 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 made it here. She 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 made she made the call. Oh yeah. Because that is what changes everything. So what I thought we should do, and Al, you may know more about this history than I do. I do think those two questions, well, one question given in two different paragraphs in Mark 10 and then mentioned again in Luke 18. So here you have a guy who's blind, and I don't know if he was told about. I picked out a couple of the verses where he would have known the prophecies about that the Son of Man would come through the Davidic line. And the two verses you can read are, there's many, but the two I picked was Second uh, Samuel 7, mm-hmm. and it gives a detailed prophecy, not only about the coming kingdom and the coming king, but of the Son of Man. There was a promise uh, made to David in that, you know, through, through Nathan. It's a, it's a long read, but it, it helps you understand, too, the uh, circumstances around the kingdom coming. And then you have uh, Jeremiah 23, 4 through 6. But it also brings to light the genealogy we read in Luke 3, the reason that's in Luke, yep. where you're going through David's line, and lo and behold, here pops up Jesus. That's right. And to go through what we talked about the kingdom and uh, Zerubbabel 
building, rebuilding the temple, the first temple that was destroyed, the, where they were worshiping with God, then it's rebuilt in the same line. And now here comes Jesus, which what I say and present is the fulfillment of the building of the temple of God, where people can dwell with God. It's in Jesus himself. Right. So if you read those, I mean, that was a one minute overview. I obviously didn't do that justice. But what I'm saying is that beggar on the side of the road, we have a contrast that Jesus and the Holy Spirit through Luke want you to see. That guy was looking for the right kind of Jesus. Here's a guy. Blind. And the irony is he couldn't see. Well, he couldn't see, but he, was, he wasn't bitter. Yeah. He, he was intellectually open-minded, yep. and he was open-minded to, uh, despite the difficulties he was going. He was looking for the promise of God to be revealed. His heart was right. And the crowd wasn't with him. Well, and the crowd was amazed that he was healed, but then all them scattered like a cubby of quail when Jesus was fixed to be crucified. There wasn't anybody taking up for Jesus in that moment. Nope. They wanted the miracles without the crucifixion, without the weakness, without this blind man through his humble circumstances, which is an indirect way to answer this forever question of why do bad things happen to us, human beings on earth? Well, it gives us perspective. And it always concludes, and there's a God and I'm not him. And I guarantee you that blind man had realized I'd rather be blind and have a clear vision of who the king of kings is than have good sight and a lot of money and miss out on heaven, eternity. I mean, that is the contrast. So even his own disciples didn't see it in, in that moment. But Jesus, who, look, they came around eventually. They hit the road at his crucifixion themselves. I mean, we're trying to give you a 30,000 overview of why Jesus is revealing these things. And I really think there's a way to see, even though you can't see. Yep. And you see it here. Which is, and I think that's why these three encounters appear in Luke, because the first one is sort of a culmination with the rich young ruler, who was a good guy who had a lot of good things going for him. But he's a culmination of everything Jesus has been talking about up to this point, that you can't do it yourself. Then he comes to the blind beggar who sees, though he can't see. And then even Zacchaeus, what was the thing that marked him? He climbed a tree to get a better look at Jesus. So he was a short guy. He couldn't see over the crowd. This rich, short tax collector, we'll talk about the next podcast, yeah. climbs a tree to get a better look at Jesus. And that opens him up to salvation. Because he was open-minded despite his power. And, but I want to leave with this. I, the One of the greatest questions you ever ask yourself in your faith is that question, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Yeah, that's a good one. Whatever you answer and however you answer is very telling on your character and perspective and who Jesus is. Because it may, it, it, there may be some pain and some discipline uh, that needs to to happen in your life for you to have a clear picture of who Jesus is and what he really wants from you you know it, it, it's just a fact in this light it was if you made that if you ask that question in the privacy of your own mind and then answer it honestly it'll say a lot about how you're viewing Jesus yep exactly what do you want from me all right so um, we're going to go to overtime just a minute blazetv.com slash unashamed because I wanted to dive a little more into that that Jay's talking about by the Davidic line there's some really good stuff in there so we'll talk about that uh, and then next time we'll pick up with the uh, with Zacchaeus uh, on the next Unashamed podcast we'll see you guys then thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes and for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.